Psycho-cybernetics. Cybernetics is a Greek word meaning helmsman, and the psycho part is your psychology. And Dr. Maxwell Maltz came up with the ideology of psycho-cybernetics, meaning steer your mind into port, and that port be in peace of mind. A little bit on the history of Dr. Maltz. This is a considerably reduced down talk from a whole day's workshop. But he was a plastic surgeon and he, would, he was a pioneer within plastic surgery. And he noticed that a lot of his patients would come to see him. About 50% of them would feel happy after having their scars removed or any disfigurement sorted. However, there was also that big part that even though their face was completely sorted, that they would have a bad self-image. They would think, well, nothing's much changed. They would think they were far more ugly than they actually were. Um, and he was saying that he thought that there needed to be something done to be worked on those inner scars as well as the outer scars. He always said that it wasn't positive thinking, but positive doing. So this just shows the self-image from some people where you have a lot of people that may think they're well overweight where indeed they're not but that's just because in life we distort generalize and delete and all this information goes in it's from upbringing that we've had as children with our parents it's also been from perhaps schooling and society in general and all this information goes in and then comes out as our behavior or our beliefs or our identity this is for some other talk that I might do with you at some stage. In NLP, we call identity. Dr. Maxwell Maltz always referred to the self-image. People with a good self-image or identity are much more happier and confident within themselves. And research has actually shown that people who have been involved in an injury may be been disabled because of the injury. Those with a healthy self-image will be still quite a happy person. So they would still think of them who they are with their likes, their interests, their friends, their hobbies. Whereas if they have a poor self-image, they'll be now thinking of themselves as being, I'm this disabled person. In life, there are real limits, but there's also self-imposed limits, which Dr. Maxwell Maltz noticed. But the self-imposed limits can also be self-conditioned limits that we've had from the upbringings, what people in society think we should think like. If you think back when Eddie Kidd, in the 90s, he was disabled from his motorbike accident, and a lot of people might think, I can't do anything anymore, and their error of possible has been reduced the right way down. There was a real limit for him. He couldn't do a marathon in one day but the possibility of actually doing a marathon was still that possibility just by breaking it down into various days and stages. So if you can realize what is a real limit rather than a self-imposed limit or condition limit, then by living with real limits, that makes a much happier person. Dr. Maltz wasn't much of a fan of willpower. He often said that willpower was almost like a rubber band. So I've got a picture of rubber bands here. Imagine if you all held a rubber band in your hand with its natural state and then you were to put the rubber band around your fingers and stretch. Now imagine going around doing your daily activities but still keeping your hand stretched holding this rubber band out. Eventually you would get what he called the snapback effect where you would let go and that's what happens a lot with people who set New Year's resolutions. They don't properly plan out how they're going to do it or use any sort of creative visualization. So it's almost like a wish list rather than it being anything that anybody can go out and achieve. Dr. Maxwell Motes was a fan of creative visualization. He referred to it as theater of the mind. Walt Disney used creative visualization to get his first feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs onto the big screen. It was the first animated feature film and this happened right at the time of the recession. So banks weren't freely giving out money. So what he did along with his brother, there was a whole lot of other role play activities they did, one being the bank manager, one being Walt Disney going in asking for the money, but he also closed his eyes and visually rehearsed what he would say to the bank manager and indeed he did get the funding in the end. So our senses, most of us will all see, 
here, feel, so touch, but also there's also the emotion as well. And where applicable in situations for mental rehearsal, there's taste and smell. So people that have used mental rehearsal, Steve Backley, several years ago when he was at his peak at his javelin throwing, injured his back and he, during the time he was laid up resting his back, he would visually close his eyes, be in his own body and visualise being on the field practising throwing the javelin. So it wasn't just that he was visualising it, he was feeling the weight of the javelin in his hand, the emotions that he would feel, any sounds that he would feel on that. And he would do this the same amount of time that he would have been out practising. And he was also pleased and delighted by the time he came back and actually was able to throw the javelin that his skill level wasn't that much under what it, what it was before. Also research has shown that people that visually imagine doing a skill like playing the piano with their keys and actually feeling the keys as well, not just seeing it, and those actually practice in front of a piano grow the same neural pathways. Also people that visualise lifting weights get some muscle growth. Now it's not they're not going to become the next Arnold Schwarzenegger just by purely imagining, but by actually just physically imagining what the weight would be like, there is some muscle growth. So Earl Nightingale from his excellent audio program Lead the Field was also a fan of visualization and I think it's important for all of us here. And he said if a business owner spent just 30 minutes a day to sit and use imagination only to think of new ways to be of better and greater service to customers, they would soon dominate their field. For that is the last thing competitors would ever do. Goal achieving. Why Dr. Maxwell Motes noticed that some people achieved goals and didn't, he would go around interviewing people and find out what was the difference that made a difference from those that achieved and those that didn't achieve. Sincerity, people had to have that passion to achieve their goals. Also as well, insincerity would stop goals. During my early days I took on a lot of smokers that came to me because their girlfriend, boyfriend or husband, wife said that they need to quit smoking. They didn't have that sincerity. I learned from that very early on that somebody has to be sincere about their goals. Precision. If you think about focusing, now there is a debate whether you do one goal at a time or several, but it's, it's important that you focus on your goal. If you think about when you were a child and you might have set light to paper with a magnifying glass, you had to have the sun's rays and the, the point on the piece of paper at that exact moment to focus, otherwise the goal of setting the paper light wouldn't actually happen. And also as well, congruence. What's important about this? Dr. Maxwell Malt said that it was important to have not only my to-do goals, but to be goals. So somebody may want to become a well-known singer and be successful, but perhaps they need to work on their confidence. So they're not just feeling uncomfortable in front of like say five people. They, that's something they can put in part of their programming to become more confident before they can then work on the to-do goal. So keeping on track, when you think of your goals, he said it's important to have 10 things that will help your goal or slash goals and you can tick them off in your diary. So you can think of them and you can think of what times you need to do these specific goals. So that could be like even reading on the internet some information about your field. When I do my workshops, I tend to get people to just say, what 10 things do you think will help with your goals? And then they'll say, and then other people can start thinking, oh, actually, that's a really good idea. I can take that idea on for myself. So it's what works for you, because not everybody's business, not everybody's goals is going to be the same and need the exact take, set, same 10 things. Self-monitoring. A lot of people say they just don't have time to work on their goals. But if people self-monitor, they'll be actually shocked throughout the day how much time we waste. Maybe people could actually spend 30 minutes less a day watching the television programs just to sit down and do some proper goal setting, get in. Finding support is very important as well. But rather than just saying to friends and family, I've got this goal, find the ones that are supportive to you. 
and sometimes maybe other NLP or psychocybernetics, you can work on goals together. Reward yourself, but be congruent. So if somebody's goal is to, say, lose weight, it's important when they've actually reached that ideal weight that they don't decide to go out for a slap at meal of burger and chips, but they may choose something like a nice item of clothing or some perfume or aftershave that they can put on to treat themselves because people like to feel rewarded when they've done well. And relaxation to avoid burnout is very important as well. Why is this? You can just take 10 minutes to maybe do some deep breathing, but if you had a lawnmower and you just decide to leave it running, all the time until you next need to cut the lawn, it won't be long before the motor burns out and people get burnout as well. Also, if you're fixed and focused too much on a problem, sometimes by stepping away from it, having that relaxation time, the subconscious mind sometimes come up with an answer and I think we've probably all experienced that at some point. So the self-image, this is Salvador Dali's image of psychocybernetics. He was a good friend of Dr. Maxwell Maltz. I understand that I'm coming close to the end of the 10 minutes, but for the question and answers, if anybody wants to ask what the image actually represents, I can go through it. It's an image of a dark side, people's poor self-image, and a light side with somebody with a good, healthy self-image. Today is obviously election day. Whoever you decide to vote for, make sure that you do it with your heart and what you feel is the right decision. But if you're going to vote for anybody throughout life, make sure you vote for yourself. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.